You could have at least given me a hand. This thing's 45 pounds. I can't lift that much. But since you guys are here, today we're going to be going over putting together an LT short block. This is an L83 5.3. It's just kind of a refresh. It's not a fancy build. We're going to be using the stock pistons, put some new bearings in it, new oil pump, new rings, uh, and just, just refreshing the motor. This one had somewhere in the high 100s, maybe 200,000 miles on it. The guy wanted to put a cam in it, but wanted it to be good so he could drive it for another 200,000. So we went through and refreshed the cylinders, just did a quick hone on them. They really don't get much ridge like on the old motors. Um, replacing the bearings, new rods, new mains. The cam bearings are actually fine. Measured them. They all came out good. Did actually measure them. Not a don't look at them type of deal. So we're going to walk through it. It's If you can put together an LS, you can put together one of these. These have a couple extra little things you got to do, but it's pretty straightforward. So I'll kind of walk you guys through that and we'll go through the, the whole process of putting this together. I figured we'll go over the parts first so you guys have a list. If you guys want to do this, you can redo them. So these are the rings. It'll focus. These are the rings that are a factory replacement from Mala. This is what they look like. Molly top, small, just small. I think they're 1.2 millimeter and like a two and a half oil ring. These are the main bearings that we'll be using. They are different than a regular LS, so they're specifically for an LT. The rod bearings are a regular LS rod bearing, small block Chevy. Oil pump is made by our friendly neighbors up north in Canada. It's just a factory replacement. Nothing too special. These are what the bearings look like out of the box. These are the aluminum topped bearings. They're just a good all around bearing for general purpose. We got our pistons, stock pistons. We cleaned up the tops. Now these have the giant hole in them, I, don't know, I guess you can call it a hole, for where the direct injected injector shoots the fuel in so they can atomize the fuel and propagate through the cylinder. And it's also got a valve relief there for the VVT and a little bit of a dome to get some more compression. So we got all those cleaned up. Cranks polished. It's all ready to go. Block's been through two hot tanks, yet still, this Tennessee mud sticks like scat to a wool blanket. Real hard to get off. But at least there's no mud on the inside. Then we got the one big difference on these compared to an LS is every LT has piston squirters. Some of the LS A's came with them, the LS9 came with them, but these all have piston squirters, and this is what they look like, if you're not familiar with them. Come on, focus on that. So they go down in that hole and squirt up some oil. Now they do have a, a relief in here, like a, a spring pressure relief, so that they will only open it, I think it's 40 pounds, so they won't be spraying oil all the time, you know, at lower oil pressure times, idle, stuff like that. Uh, so when the RPM's up is when they'll be really spraying some oil. Another big difference on these compared to the LS's is that for the front cover, the oil pan, and the rear cover, they do not run any gaskets. They just run silicone, but it's a special kind of silicone, which... is this stuff right here. So this is not the GM stuff, obviously, but it is OEM, meets OEM specs. 
So it's their gray silicone. It's good for vibration and all of that. It's a little bit different than normal black stuff, but this is what you want to use when you're putting on the pan and the front cover. Otherwise it will leak. So we're going to get into first. We're going to check these clearances here. You can't do that at home unless you have a board gauge and everything else, but we're going to do it because I'm putting my name on it and I, I want to know for sure that it's right. And we'll find out how close are these bearings in this block. You know, what does it look like? So we'll get into that part. All right. So first thing I always do on an LS or an LT is put in a new barbell. That goes in the back of the block. If you're not familiar with that, there's a hundred people who have shown that before. Second thing I always do is put in these piston squirters because I have been known to forget. And once the crank's in there, it's a real pain. Let's go ahead and slide these things in there. I will usually put in just a little squirt of blue Loctite because I do not want to be the guy that these come out on. We'll slide those right in there like that. on it. And that's what we get. Lots of little shinies that we don't need in the motor. Now, before you guys get started on me for reusing torque to yield bolts, I think there's a little understanding to go into how you can reuse these. So if you try to yield these bolts again, you'll most likely break them. If you torque them to just a, a torque spec um, with lube and everything else that's underneath that yield point, you can reuse them. Now, torque to yield is basically your, they've calculated out whatever angle it is you need in order to go up to the point of yield of the bolt to where it's a maximum stretch, maximum clamping force, so it can hold these things down. Now, there's obviously an overhead built in on all of these things, 20, 30, 50%, whatever that is, to where we can still use the strength of the bolt that is left in a lower torque setting and still have the clamping force we need to keep these caps where we want them. So. Can you reuse them? Yes. Do they have a certain lifespan? Yes, every fastener does. But if you try to yield them a second time or a third time, you'll most likely break them because you're basically getting to the point where that bolt is starting to fail. So as long as we stay underneath that, we'll be okay. I'm going to get the gauge set up. We're going to check these clearances. All right, so I have this gauge set up at the diameter of the crankshaft, so whatever this reads. This will be our bearing clearance. So first one we're showing about two five. You kind of move it around the bore a little bit just to make sure you're getting what you want. Two three is about the tightest I saw. So we'll mark that down as our tightest. And that's usually what I set it up for. I try and set it up for 
whatever the tightest part of the bore is going to be and make sure that it isn't under what I want. Because it's, in this case, a little worse to be tight. Maybe not the case for everything. For a lot of things, probably. But, don't want it too tight. That one measures one knot. Okay. This one's measuring 3.3, three, which is a little big. It is tightening up here on the sides. At the tightest point, we're at 2.9. It's a little bigger than I would like, but I also do not have an undersized bearing to make this work. This one's showing. One eight at the tightest, which is about the minimum I would want. Also one eight at the tightest. So that's where we're at. All right, clearances are good. Let's take it back apart. Slide the crank in here and see how it spins. So now we got that in there, spins very nicely. I haven't even set the thrust yet, now it's a little cold and it's got some really heavy red oil. This is what I normally use, this is the engine assembly loop that Torco makes mm -hmm. and if you're familiar with this stuff, it's like syrup, gets in everything, doesn't taste quite as good though. So now I'm going to check the thrust and then we'll be ready to start on the rings. All right, got our little dial indicator set up here, and we're gonna see here. We got maybe about one before the oil soaks back in, and one over there. So one under, one over. About two ish. I think that'll cut the cheese. Now we're on to checking the rings. So I measured all these bores. They're all within a few tenths of each other. So next thing is, so I'm just, in that case, I don't need to necessarily do each cylinder because I know they're all pretty close. So we'll grab some rings here. I'm going to start with the top. And we're going to see what clearance they got out of the box. Now I check them all. I check oil, even the oil rails. So, cause I want to make sure that I don't put something together and it has a problem. What we're shooting for, Mahler recommends 4,000 per inch of bore at a minimum. So let's see what we're at. We got this tool here, which is adjustable and you can slide the ring down, make sure it's square. So you get an accurate measurement. 
as I loosen it up. Try that again. Maybe not so ham-fisted this time. Okay. All right. By my calibrated eyeball, that looks to be about 15 thousandths. And sure enough, it is. Slides right in. So, if we do our calculations, the minimum is probably going to be about 14 thousandths. Let's see. So 3.78 times 4 thousandths equals 15. So we're right there. So we'll leave that. We'll check them all, make sure we're at least 15. And then go ahead and put them on the pistons. Now to check the rods, just like the mains. See what kind of clearance we got. Come on. That right, kind of about two four. It opens up nicely, so that'll be good enough for us. So the last thing that I do before I put the pistons in is I clean up the cylinder bores with some oil and I clean rag. Now we do a, I guess you can call it a three or four stage cleaning process where we will, after honing, we'll take some gojo or like a pumice soap and we'll go through and try and get all the grit out of the, the hatch that way. Then we'll wipe all that out. Then we'll put it into one hot tank as it's coming out of that hot tank, we'll kind of wash it out, blow the cylinders out, put it into a second hot tank that runs just the cleaning, like a final clean, to make sure that none of the grease or the grit or anything else is in the final clean motor. Um, and then the last step is taking some of this and wiping the cylinders out to make sure to get all the extra grit out of it. So the towel is clean right now. Wipe this out. And I'll usually do it twice on each cylinder that's enough to make me feel good that i got everything out of there i gotta watch this piston squirter down here at the bottom we can already see there's some sort of debris in there that we don't need when we're putting it together the thicker the oil you use uh, the better Okay, and there's our improvement between the two. Now we can hit it a third time. I know there probably won't be anything left in there. So I'm gonna go ahead and just do the rest of these. Now we got all the rings on, 
the bearings in. We're ready to put this thing together. So let's get into it. It's all together, went pretty smooth. I believe that with the bearings that we used, the rings that we used, uh, all the other pieces that were in here, I don't see why you couldn't do this in your garage. If you got yourself a LAD3 that's starting to use a little more oil or it's got a bunch of miles on it and you're just worried about it, I, I don't see why you couldn't do this in your garage, Te tear it apart. You know, clean everything up a little bit, put it all back together. I mean, these bearings seem to be close enough to where you shouldn't have to to check them. It's always a good idea, uh, but you know, proceed at your own risk as far as checking them or not checking them. But overall, I mean, this motor should go another two hundred and, and not have a problem. Uh, but I really appreciate you guys watching, and we'll see you on part two where we put the cam and the cylinder heads and everything else on these, on this motor. <laughs>